Uh, I think the underlying premise of this question is that those who came after 2003 don't have the necessary qualifications and the gravitas, as it were, to run the state. And we had this cadre of people whose only fault was that they joined the Ba'ath Party. Otherwise, they were incredibly competent. And, and I, I personally don't believe that. I mean, the, Ba'ath, the Ba'ath, high Ba'athist officials, some of them were good, some of them were not, like what we have after, after, the, after the, uh, the invasion. Nevertheless, a lot of Ba'athis, and some of them extremely high-ranking, managed to infiltrate the political process by joining political parties, and their sins were forgiven. I mean, I remember when, when I was in the government, there were several incidents of very, very high-level Ba'athis who, for one reason or another, were exempted from, these, uh, from the de-Ba'athification measures. So it's not really hard and fast rule that if you're a senior Ba'athist, somehow or another, you're not allowed to enter into uh, uh, political practice unless your livelihood is, as it were, your, your iron bowl is broken. Uh, this is not the case, I think. With that in mind, I still maintain that these people were working for a state that by and large put us into two wars and was responsible for the invasion or creating the circumstances by which our country was invaded. So I can't, by any standard, see why they should be allowed to misgovern the country again. Do you have anything to add, and if not? Um, well, I, I do think that the the scale of debathification has been somewhat exaggerated in popular imagination, uh, uh, popular perception. Um, the the debathification process affected one percent of Bath Party members. In other words, one only one in a hundred of Bath Party members were affected, which meant it was zero point one percent of the population as a whole. In other words, one person in a thousand. So uh, it was far less sweeping than it is generally uh, appeared to be. Um, in gross numbers, the numbers were fairly high. Several tens of thousands um, of officials lost their positions. Um, unlike denazification, um, where uh, a much higher percentage, 25, per 25 times higher percentage, not only were banned from public office, they were banned from anything except manual labor whereas in Iraq they were only banned from public office and could uh, hold any other profession they chose. Um, uh, the, uh, so, so the numbers, the, the, the total numbers were more limited than generally appreciated. Uh, in fact, um, the total numbers were probably not very different than the number of officials uh, that change uh, jobs when uh, Democrats replace Republicans in this country if you had all state, local, and federal elections at the same time. Uh, and then the turnover in patronage positions uh, would be on a somewhat similar scale. Um, it's not unusual uh, or that if, that the new politicians, like Mr. Alawi, who took office in 2003, uh, would expect to find positions in the administration for their supporters rather than Saddam's. That's how our system works. Uh, and it's certainly how um, other systems that are even more patronage driven than ours uh, work. Uh, and so I'm afraid that we're going to have to largely live with those consequences, whether or not there may have been some degree of unfairness with respect to individuals. Uh, we've got time for about one more question, and I'd like to start with Michael Corbin for this one. And that is that this conference opened with an American ambassador saying, criticizing this administration by saying, we're not paying enough attention to Iraq, that Afghanistan has sucked all of our resources away, and that we are in danger of not paying enough attention. Um, do you find any truth in that criticism? I think we'll always be criticized. I think that's why this transition from a security-based rela relationship to a relationship based on a broader um, uh, partnership is so important. I think President Obama made very clear in his Camp Lejeune speech that we do have a commitment to Iraq, and we are committed through 2012 with the military, and then beyond that in terms of the Strategic Framework Agreement. So we will face this criticism. It's something that we will work with all the time. Um, but we think that we have partners in the Iraqis who want to work on institution building and on the economy principally. Jim Dahman? I just add, I mean, we still have twice as many troops, almost twice as many troops in Iraq as we do in Afghanistan. We certainly have a much larger number of diplomats and civilians in Iraq than we do in Afghanistan. So while there certainly has been a shift in public attention, and probably a shift in attention uh, uh, by the President and his principal advisors in terms of where they're spending their time, I don't think it's yet translated into a shift in resources. Um, 
I, I do think there's one area where uh, I'm, I'm slightly critical of the administration, and that is that I don't see enough attention being paid to the regional aspects of stabilizing Iraq. You know, we've got a special envoy for Afghanistan. He spends a lot of time talking to Pakistan, talking to China, talking to her, uh, and trying to talk to Iran, uh, and I engaged in regional diplomacy designed to promote uh, convergent pressures on the Afghans from uh, regional powers who have influence. And I don't think we're doing enough of that with respect to Iraq. It's not a job that Chris Hill can do uh, from, uh, from Baghdad. Um, and, uh, uh, and while I'm not sure this administration needs yet another czar, um, it, is, uh, it is a job that at the moment is going begging. Ren, does uh, this administration need to do more in a country that you called anything but normal? Well, um, first of all, I, I would agree with James Dobbins that um, there's no, there isn't a go-to person on Iraq, uh, and and um, the vice president is not. You really can't think of the vice president as the go-to person. As the, uh, I mean, he's got other things, so I think something like that would be uh, helpful, um, and I don't. I do think that more diplomatic engagement. For example, let me just uh, go back. On this uh, strategic framework agreement, which was signed in late 2008, very little was done. And uh, none of the committees that were supposed to uh, be set up and functional actually were functioning. At one point, they eliminated the political diplomatic committee. Uh, it's only with the trip, the most recent trip of the prime minister here, that something began to, to move forward and the strategic framework agreement began to be implemented. Um, and this is not just for a lack of interest on the Iraqi side. I think there was a lack of attention also on the American side. And as I say, I do believe that the future of the region, that certainly the, the Middle East proper, uh, is highly dependent on which way Iraq goes. And therefore, I think it behooves the United States to be more engaged. Ali Alawi, you have the last word. Uh, I mean, I think somewhat, uh, somewhat differently. That I think the United States military presence in Iraq in terms of uh, its fighting al-Qaeda, fighting insurgents, and acting as a stabilizing element internally uh, should come to an end. Uh, I think it is no longer. The, the, we are now in a different phase uh, in the sort of political culture of the country in the post-2003 period. The first one started in 2003 and ended at some time around 2007. And the presence of the United States military may, of course, help in terms of uh, uh, controlling extreme uh, bouts of violence. But it will also, also stop, I think, the Iraqi security services themselves from becoming more directly engaged in this process. Nevertheless, I think if the United States wants to maintain uh, its role and have some kind of uh, return, as it were, on this investment that they've made in Iraq and in, in, in life and treasure, it's far, far better done and exercised in the soft areas. And here I don't mean just diplomatic and political, but in terms of uh, cultural and economic support, especially economic support, where a, a, a large part of the stabilization of the country and turning it into a modern state is going to rest. So the US should really change gears. And it may be already be doing that without actually articulating it, so that the military presence is then phased out within President Obama's time frame and replaced by a far more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, benign but focused uh, set of activities in institution building and in the economic area. If that happens, I think uh, the US will be relatively secure in terms of uh, the return on its, on its engagement with Iraq. And Iraq will be not just a long-term ally because of the military aspects of it, but an ally because of a set of interwoven and interconnecting interests. Thank you very much, and thank you, audience, for being so patient. We're a little over time. Time for coffee.